started today. So uh, I'm Kat Trago. I'm the Wisconsin ACEDS chapter president, and I am thrilled today to introduce um, the third installment of our Emoji series, the judges panel. And I'm very interested in um, what our judges today have to say about all the things we've been talking about for the past several months. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that our fourth and final program is the networking program. It is next week, so it's a pretty quick turnaround on this one. Um, it is next Thursday, December 8th. If I will put in the chat a link to register, but um, the Ohio chapter has been in charge of putting together a really fun activity and also there will be some snacks available. So I hope you can all join us for the final installment. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kelly Twigger, who's going to be moderating today. She is prob probably most of you would recognize her from the case of the week. Uh, one of those episodes will be linked in, also in the chat today um, as it refers to the Rosbach, Rosbach case, which uh, will be covered today. Um, but without further ado, Kelly, would you like to introduce our judges today? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Kat. Uh, first, a big thank you to you, uh, to Summer Wall, to the entire committee who's put together this series. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of it, and we really appreciate it. Also, a big thanks to uh, Reveal, who sponsored our CLE for today's presentation. That's a big lift, and we really appreciate their input there, together with Patrick's uh, Bill Jair's work from Reveal. Um, before we jump into introducing the judges, I just want to say that, you know, when you called me, Kat, and asked me to do this, uh, I think back this summer when you were putting together the series, I wondered out loud to you, um, and the judges and I had the same discussion as to whether or not there would be enough content about emojis to talk for an hour. Um, and I think once we dived in, we've seen uh, the other work that's been done on the other two parts of the webinar series, and as we, we looked at some of the case law and some of the issues, it's a great time to talk about this really complicated source of ESI, and I'm really thrilled uh, to be able to welcome uh, two of my favorite jurists uh, to today's program. Uh, so let me go ahead and introduce them. Uh, first, uh, Judge William Matthewman. Uh, Judge Matthewman was appointed to the federal bench in 2002. He sits in the West Palm Beach uh, Division of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida. We're grateful that Judge Matthewman did not have any damage to his home during the last hurricane that prompted us to switch our program to today. Um, as a magistrate judge, Judge Matthewman handles both civil and criminal cases, including pretrial uh, matters as well as trials. Prior to joining the bench, uh, Judge Matthewman was a very active trial attorney for both civil and criminal trials. Uh, he was also involved in high profile cases that were covered uh, on television and live session on Court TV, has been on Realign at 48 Hours and other programs. He's board certified by the Florida Bar in criminal trial practice before his appointment to the bench and is rated to the AV by Dale Hubble. He's been a member of the Florida Bar and a trial lawyer since 1983. Um, he is also a University of Florida Law School alum and regularly joins us for the UF uh, e-discovery conference that's coming up in February. We're looking forward to having him back as a part of the faculty this year. Uh, finally, Judge Matthewman is the author of an article that I commend to you all, and I'll try and grab a link to chat for us here or add to the materials if you know, Judge Matthewman is amenable. I'm going to put him on the spot. Uh, but it's an article entitled Towards a New Paradigm for E-Discovery in Civil Litigation, a Judicial Perspective, uh, published in the Florida Law Review in September of 2019. That's some excellent thoughts on where things are moving forward in discovery related to the electronic information. Welcome, Judge Matthewman. Thanks for being here. Kelly, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but there's been a lot of feedback on your end. Oh. Nope. So it was, it started out great. I don't know, something moved, but I just wanted to make sure everyone can hear everyone. Am I still giving feedback now? Much better for me. Okay. Thank you. I can't hear anything on my end. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, let me try that again. Welcome, Judge Matthewman. Hello, how are you? Good to see everybody. Great. Thanks for being here, Judge. You're welcome. Uh, Glad to be here. Okay. Um, also with us today is Judge Xavier Rodriguez, uh, 
Judge Rodriguez is a former Texas Supreme Court Justice and currently sits on the bench as a United States District Judge for the Western District of Texas. Uh, prior to joining the bench, uh, Judge Rodriguez was a partner in the international law firm of Fulbright and Jaworski. Uh, Judge Rodriguez uh, is a frequent speaker on continuing legal education seminars, has author, authored numerous articles uh, in multiple areas of the law, including electronic discovery. He's the author or editor of The Essentials of E-Discovery, which is a book in the Texas Bar Books, um, edited in 2021. He's a member of the Sedona Conference Judicial Advisory Board, the Georgetown AEDI Advisory Board, and serves as a distinguished visiting jurist in residence and adjunct professor of law at St. Mary's University School of Law. He is also the recipient of many awards. Um, and quite frankly, both of our judges are members of the great, great human uh, club. Um, Judge Rodriguez uh, is a Texas native, um, received his bachelor's from Harvard and his master's from the University of Texas uh, School of Public Affairs, as well as his doctorate um, of law from the University of Texas. Uh, we are also fortunate to have Judge Rodriguez joining us on the faculty of the University of Florida eDiscovery Conference this year. Welcome, Judge Rodriguez. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for the invite, Kelly. Okay. I'm gonna dive in as we're already about 10 minutes past the hour and we have a lot of content uh, to cover. Um, a couple of things before we dive into this is the issue that I had from an e-discovery perspective is why do emojis even present a problem? Why are they an issue in e-discovery? And if you watched the first two sessions of our uh, emoji series, you saw a lot of the information on what goes into an emoji, the code that makes it up. And so I want to just cover a couple of those things briefly this morning as context for the legal issues that arise in emojis. Um, if you watched uh, part one of our series um, given by a gentleman from Trustpoint, um, you saw that uh, emojis are essentially code. They are not individual text characters. And uh, there are multiple ways in which emojis can be created. Uh, there is a, a consortium called the Unicode Consortium that issues new emojis each year. Uh, and those new emojis are then distributed to uh, manufacturers who incorporate them into their products. So for example, I'm an iPhone user. If you're an iPhone user or an Android user, you'll get new emojis issued to you when you do updates where new emojis are parts of those platforms. So why does that matter? Well, it matters in terms of, and we'll see in some of the case law, when emojis are released, what emojis are available, how they're created, um, and how you can collect them. Um, this is a little bit of follow-up from content that we've seen earlier, but the Unicode uh, consortium creates an emoji um, by using code. So it's a character or a symbol to a numeric value that allows sharing of documents. The problem becomes when that code is read by different platforms and the visualization. Think about when you create a PowerPoint uh, like we've done for today, and you email it to someone else and they don't have the font downloaded that you used. So the visualization that they pull up on their screen is different. The same thing happens with emojis. And so that's what kind of creates a lot of issues for us. The second thing comes up when uh, companies or individuals create proprietary emojis and they can make up their own emojis that are not part of Unicode and they can distribute them to anyone they want to. We see that a lot in Slack um, because Slack allows you to upload your own custom emojis. Uh, Teams has a similar function um, and other platforms do as well. So that comes down to who created the emoji, what was the intent of the emoji and the interpretation that we'll discuss. Um, there are many tools to allow you to create your own emojis. So you've got Unicode issued emojis, private emojis, anybody creating their own emojis using any of these tools. So how do we deal with those from a legal perspective when emoji is meant to share or create an emotion um, when or communicate some sort of feeling when they are shared? Now, one of the things that came up in our initial discussions were what is the difference between an emoji, an emoticon, and even a meme? Um, so the emoji has is a picture that is represented by code. So behind the, emo the picture is actual code. An emoticon is actual text. So you can see the difference there on the right side of the screen that I've used a colon 
and a parenthetical to create a smiley face emoticon. Um, an emoticon doesn't pose the same kinds of issues that we have with emojis. Um, memes, uh, quite frankly, this is something that Judge Rodriguez uh, raised when we first started talking about this issue. Memes, uh, as Kat helped us uh, track down, are really pictures. So they're pictures with text on them. If the text can be OCR, then you can search via that format. So they don't present the same kinds of issues that we have with emojis. I think uh, when you start talking about uh, GIFs, um, then you get into a whole different area of moving text and issues that we're not going to cover today. Okay, so what are the legal issues that are created by emojis? Um, diving right into that, we're going to start uh, right away with importance and interpretation. Um, and I'm going to uh, toss this over to, to Judge Matthewman and and ask you, Judge Matthewman, you know, what are some of the scenarios that interpretation of emojis can can cause issues for in litigation? You know, what about when a custodian creates their own emoji? How what are you looking at as a judge to be able to interpret that information? Well, you know, whether whether it's the judge hearing it or the jury hearing it, the idea is you want to understand what the sender was trying to say, what what their point was. And with a uh, with an emoji, there can be an interpretation as to what it might mean. Somebody could make a statement with either a um, a thumbs up or thumbs down or winking uh, emoji or or any of the other numerous ones that are out there, um, and it could be misinterpreted by the receiver or misinterpreted by the judge or misinterpreted by the jury because uh, these really are somewhat personal to the sender. The sender is trying to, uh, to convey a thought, and the sender thinks that by adding in this emoji, it, it makes the written word a little bit more persuasive or a little bit more clear as to what the sender is trying, uh, is trying to say. So I think it's two important points legally. One, what did the sender intend to say? And how do you determine that? And number two, what did the receiver of the message understand the message to say? Because both of those, I think, are important when you're in uh, when you're involved in litigation. And you know, quite frankly, the emojis can clarify or they can mystify a statement. You know, whether the person was being ironic, whether the person was being, uh, uh, you know, accurate, whether the person was saying something in jest or was saying something factually, all those things can be affected uh, by the uh, by the emoji that or the num the plural emojis that might be included in the uh, in the in the statement. So I think they're important to a full understanding of what the sender was trying to say and then what the receiver thinks the sender was telling them. And just to follow up on that, and, and Judge Rodriguez, please jump in here. You know, this is not something that I use, but, and we didn't put any in the slides, but sometimes there are entire patterns, you know, five, six, seven different emojis that are meant to, to spell out a sentence for you. You know, what do you as jurists, when you're looking to interpret what that information means, what do you want to have? You want to have someone on the stand that's going to interpret that for you? And who does that need to be? So hopefully in a civil case, let's start with that first. In, in a civil case, if it's if it's going to be really critical to an understanding of the tone and the context of the text message or the email may have been, uh, or the Slack communication, whatever it was, uh, hopefully we, we've 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 decided to, to explore this in a deposition because uh, I don't think anybody wants to be doing this for the first time at trial uh, and uh, had this blow up in your face. Uh, so I think it's going to be critical. Uh, the the takeaways here is you're going to need to understand your data. And, and when you have data that have emojis, uh, you're going to need to understand that we're going to have to have uh, questions raised at deposition about to the sender, what did you intend to communicate? Uh, what did this emoji mean uh, to you as you sent it? Uh, and then uh, a, perhaps a deposition from the recipient, uh, same questions in reverse. Uh, what what did you uh, take away from this? Or why did you feel threatened? Why did you feel confused? Whatever the case may be. Uh, and, and so 
we're going to need to have that kind of context uh, explained. Uh, now, if there's going to be a, a, a debate about, well, they said they intended this, but the other set party says, I, I received this message, and it was completely contrary to what the, the sender is saying. Well, then we got a real, we got a real problem. And especially when it's something like what you're uh, alluding to, uh, Kelly, uh, a, a sentence of emojis. Uh, you know, uh, the earlier the, the the slide that you gave to the to the to the group uh, talked about hieroglyph, hieroglyphic uh, 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 Rosetta Stone uh, kind of a uh, 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 world we may be living in. You know, but but even there, so we got the Rosetta Stone, and that was sort of the the dictionary uh, to what you know the hieroglyphics uh, meant. Uh, we don't have anything like that right now. So if you can go to Google, you you can actually Google sort of emoji dictionaries, but they're not recognized by anyone yet uh, in a court of law as being any kind of definitive source. Uh, and so we're 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 sort of in a new world here. And that's civil cases. Now, criminal cases, criminal cases normally don't have any discovery depositions taken. So there we're really, uh, you know, exploring in front of the jury in real time with the jury uh, what these messages might have meant. Uh, and um, and there, you know, I think lawyers are going to have to be really on their toes uh, to understand uh, and uh, and have their clients uh, prepped. Uh, for any questions that may be raised. Thanks, Judge. Um, one of the things that was just on that list of considerations for us um, is this notion of generational differences in the use of emojis. And I think, I mean, the three of us represent one generation and there are other generations much younger than us. Uh, I know as the mother of three teenagers that my children regular commu regularly communicate with me um, in emojis. And uh, what are your experiences um, in terms of use of emojis in your everyday lives, what you see in terms of these differences? And how do we take that into account? Well, you know, I do now use emojis uh, for, for, for many years. I really didn't uh, address them at all and I never, never uh, used them Sometimes I thought they were just more confusing. Um, I know a lot of, uh, like my children, for example, all uh, often you often will use them, um, and sometimes they convey a thought. Sometimes they don't. I do think there is a general generational difference. I think the uh, uh, the 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 younger uh, individuals are more likely to use them, and probably the older individuals are less likely to use them. And uh, Perhaps maybe misuse them uh, and and send them uh, send them wrongly. And I will just say one other thing: when Judge Rodriguez was talking about criminal cases, it's also interesting because you know in a criminal case the defendant is often the one who's sending these texts, and there'll be emojis attached. But the defendant has a constitutional right not to testify. So very often these texts will be admitted, but the defendant. Uh, him or herself will likely not testify. So then comes a question of how the jury or the court interprets those emojis. So it's it's really interesting. And it could very well be that a young, a, a defendant who's young or a defendant who's old might be using the emojis in a in a different way due to the generational difference. And and I would agree with you. Um, one of the things that Kat and I were discussing uh, prior to this, and and she sent over was that um, now there is uh, the thumbs up emoji, emoji is now viewed by Gen Z as being passive aggressive. <laughs> to which my response is, "Huh, I didn't know that." My Gen Z <laughs> child sends me a thumbs up all the time, and I communicate it. It comes to me, and I go, "Okay, good, you got it, and you're in agreement." That's that to me is what thumbs up means. So I think that's just a real life example that's very simple of uh, how different people can mean different things. And I, I think the takeaway from, from the discussion on this issue is uh, you've got to start at the beginning of your case, understand that there are emojis that are involved in the evidence and plan for how you want those to be interpreted and what that testimony is going to have to mean in a criminal context 
ostensibly uh, you could call someone to the stand or who that might already be a witness that would have received a similar text with an emoji attached to it from that defendant and could testify as to what their interpretation was. Is that viable? So Kelly, we go, we got a gunner in the audience. I see Eric is uh, sending out messages. Uh, so Eric Mandel sends out a very good uh, uh, message in the chat. Uh, you know, if there was an emoji dictionary, uh, would we be able to instruct the jury on on what these emojis potentially meant? Uh, you know, I'm not sure about that. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, so what would happen generally in a in a case where you know some legal term would have to be defined? Uh, we would generally charge somebody or charge a jury with the definition of uh, of some established you know, legal phrase and perhaps use Black's Law Dictionary or use the language from a statute uh, and then give that to the jury as the definition. Uh, here, because tone and context, all that matters, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, 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 I almost think I'd like to hear Judge Matthewman's uh, 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 thoughts on this. I, I'm, I'm almost of the opinion we can't charge juries and we just leave it to their collective wisdom uh, as to how they define uh, what was what was meant by the emoji uh, when they deliberate? I, I agree with Judge Rodriguez. I don't think we can instruct the jury on the emojis. I think it's it, if anything, it would be you should take uh, the testimony of the witness or the evidence, you know, and determine it according to your common sense, something like that. Because I don't think there would be any legitimate way to define them. For example, I could think in a in a, in a civil employment case, maybe a, a, a harassment case, sexual harassment case, maybe an older uh, employee or supervisor uh, gets a, a proposal, uh, a, some sort of business proposal or some sort of you know memo, whatever, from a younger employee um, and sends back a heart, which the older employee probably means, well, I really like your proposal, and the other employee, maybe a, a, a subordinate, takes that as some sort of advance uh, of an improper nature. So, you know, it would be really hard to define uh, for a jury um, what the emoji means. I, I will tell you that I would love to have an experiment one day where a witness were testifying and the jury was able to use emojis while the witness was testifying. I would love to get real life uh, feedback from the jurors as to how they are perceiving uh, that witness with emojis. That would be quite frankly, um, uh, very interesting. And, and on that point, there are times I would love during a hearing to be able to use emojis when the lawyers are arguing. I'm not sure what those emojis would be, but uh, they would, they would uh, be attempting to convey a point, that's for sure. There's an angry face judge with lots of, uh, you know, uh, Things coming out indicating that you might be using some improper language that might be useful in that sort of context. Okay, let's move on uh, to our next issue, which talks about collection. And uh, we covered some of this in the in part two of our segment um, when we had some vendors who came on and, and talked about how their software is used to collect emojis. And it kind of highlights for us some of the issues that we have um, in collection, given the fact that emojis are in fact code and the display of that code is really going to impact uh, whether or not the emojis present from an evidentiary perspective. And while there's not a huge amount of case law on emojis yet, we did pick out a few, uh, a couple of cases for today's discussion. And one of them that I wanted to bring up here is the state versus lesser case. Now, this is a criminal case. Um, it's a solicitation case. And essentially what happened here is um, the police officer uh, had a con a police officer um, posing as a 14 year old girl had a conversation with um, the defendant via chat. Lots of emojis were involved, and um, following the chat, the arrest was made. The police officer took screenshots of the emojis and used those ev that evidence at the preliminary hearing. But after the preliminary hearing in preparation for trial, worked directly with a forensic examiner, um, used a tool called Snagit to be able to go back and forensically collect uh, the evidence to be able to present it at trial. 
Um, and so kind of the questions that I have for you judges are from a collection perspective, whether we're in a criminal or a civil concept uh, or a civil case, what are the considerations that we need to be thinking about as lawyers uh, for um, collecting emojis? So uh, two things, I guess. Uh, one is criminal versus civil. So in the collection process, you know, I, I think it it doesn't matter. We ought to be trying to collect if this is going to be relevant and necessary, uh, we, we we need to collect the emojis. How we go about the collection uh, 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 matters, whether it's a criminal case or a civil case. Because uh, in a criminal case, we're, we're worried about somebody's uh, liberties uh, being deprived. And, and so a lot of case law, especially in the social media context, uh, and especially regarding Facebook, are concerned about uh, alteration uh, of the social media. And so uh, I, I, we have the same rules of evidence, but I think a lot of courts in the criminal context have been much more concerned about authenticity uh, in both the collection process and and proving up the, uh, the item uh, before uh, it would be uh, admitted for trial. The civil context is a little lesser burden. Uh, now, on, on collection, we, we get, unfortunately, a lot of, of solicitation of minor cases in federal court, either because it's crossing state lines or in, in the case here in San Antonio, we have a lot of military bases and apparently uh, some servicemen uh, in military bases have this problem. But uh, and so, you know, the, these chat messages sometimes are coming in at such a, a, a voluminous rate uh, that the agent who's posing as a child or has taken over the child's phone is basically just snapping uh, on on a separate phone uh, images of the text as quickly as they can. Uh, and so I'm I'm not here to say that that's not going to be uh, in uh, uh, that's not going to be admitted. It, it, you know, it's just going to have to now prove up on that separate phone. We've got when the time stamped and so forth of when the the message was taken. So some of this might be might be okay, uh, but you know, of course, the, the native is always uh, best. Well, and I think somebody asked the question, and I'll just turn this over to you in just a second, Judge Matthewman. But somebody asked the question of: Is it, it do a, can an emoji appear different on different platforms? And I think, like all things in the legal world, it depends. But the answer is, it can happen. And so um, you do have to make a consideration for that. Um, we also know from collection perspective that if I collect information, then I process it through, let's say I do a, a complete forensic collection of a mobile device and it's processed through Celebrite. Um, it then goes into a relativity platform. There has to be QC done to be able to ensure that you're, that you're seeing the same content in your review platform that you collected from the device. So however you need to do that QC process, that needs to be done to ensure um, you know, the efficacy of the evidence and your ability to be able to say to the court that this is an accurate representation of the information. Judge Matthewman, what are your thoughts there? Well, um, I do think, first of all, on collection, that you have to make sure that all of these emojis are collected in whatever way you can do that correctly. So there's no allegation of uh, spoliation later on in the case. So I think uh, from a collection point of view, uh, both sides have to make sure that they maintain, hopefully, and, and produce in native format, uh, you know, the communications along with the emojis, because I do think the emojis are relevant to the communication. I mean, I know I have sent uh, uh, text and emails uh, saying something in jest and putting a emoji there so the receiver understands that what I just said was was a joke. Um, so it would be unfair to the sender uh, to not have that emoji included in there, number one. Number two is you have to make sure that they're collected in, in the same way that they were sent because I couldn't think of anything more unfair than a sender sending a, a statement, a communication, whether it's text, email, whatever, uh, with an emoji, and then somehow the other side receiving that and it being a different connotation, uh, showing something different. And so I think, um, you know, I think that the collection is extremely important. And I do think from a production point of view, 
um, you know, they have to be they have to be produced uh, with the emojis because they can change the concept of what is um, uh, of what is being said. So, text, yeah, text I think collection is very important. Yep, yeah, I agree. I agree. And that kind of segues us very nicely. Thanks, Judge, into our next issue, which is talking about ESI protocols. And just for purposes of the audience, as we, as I sat down to pull together information for this, and then the judges and I were talking about these various issues, this is a hard, a hard topic to kind of organize effectively. So really, we just want to try to present these various issues to you to give you thoughts of how you need to deal with emojis in your particular litigation. So I want to turn now to um, the ever popular issue of the ESI protocol. Uh, which will make Judge Rodriguez chuckle because we had quite the back and forth about protocols uh, at the Georgetown AEDI week before last. Um, this particular case from the, the Weisenberger, this is just a protocol that was approved by the court. And I wanted to include this language here for the audience as one, just one way in which you might deal with um, emojis as part of an ESI protocol. But what I want to uh, kick to the judges here are, you know, what are your thoughts? Is is an ESI protocol the place to deal with emojis? How should lawyers think about this? What should be the timing uh, for understanding whether you have emojis in your case and those complexity issues? What, what is judges speaks to you on this particular issue of should they be in a protocol? What do you want to see? How do you want the parties to handle them? I think it all depends on type of case. So, you know, in an intellectual property case, I just can't imagine emojis being all that relevant and necessary to be worried about. Uh, but, you know, if we have a sexual harassment case, then that's a completely different type of case. And maybe we ought to be there or a race harassment case. I, I could see in those type of cases where emojis uh, are going to have much more uh, of, uh, of a likely presence. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of ESI protocols. Uh, I mean, uh, it, to the extent parties can agree to some stuff, that's great. Uh, but if you get bogged down on issues like emoji preservation and production, well, perhaps that's something you set aside and and you deal with that on, a, on an item by item basis, rather uh, via a protocol. Uh, you know, uh, I was mentioning a couple of weeks ago uh, that, you know, from a judge's perspective, unfortunately, we, 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 our world is tainted, right? What, what we see is the failures. So all we see is the ESI failures. I'm sure there's been a lot of successful ESI protocols that go without a glitch. Uh, but oftentimes what I see and what I read are cases where the parties have gone on three, four, five months negotiating an ESI protocol. It's failed. They haven't tested the protocol. Uh, and then all of a sudden, everybody's looking to the court for for a bailout. And so, uh, uh, if 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 that's what's going on, I'm not sure that helps us all that much. Just if if you don't mind, if I follow up on that for a minute, Judge, um, one of the issues we have, and and this is a case that I think we've talked about a whole bunch of times in eDiscovery, is the Noom case where um, Judge Parker. Uh, didn't force Noom to recollect uh, mail from Google um, because they didn't collect the hyperlinks as attachments. And so similarly here, if we collect data that doesn't have the emojis attached or isn't in context of the text, as Judge Matthew was just describing, and we don't have some sort of written agreement about how that's going to be handled, if someone produces it to me and I come to you and I say, Judge, I can't use this this way. Are you going to order them to produce it again? So uh, what we, we saw in Noom is there was an ESI protocol. The problem with it, with it being an ESI protocol is it's a judicial order now. And so then now we one party or the other uh, or both have to seek a modification of the order. And sub judges are reluctant to revisit issues because they said, hey, you all agree to this and this is the way it's going to be. Uh, which is why I think we shouldn't get too bogged down on too many details in ESI protocols because issues come up that we did not anticipate. So in Noom, what happened was uh, these links uh, were in uh, some documents. And uh, and so instead of the the the, do uh, the data being resident in, in whatever Word document or so forth, 
if you hit the link, it would take you off to another spot, and no one anticipated that uh, uh, at the beginning. Uh, so are we going to be bound by some ESI order that didn't anticipate some unexpected events? Uh, I, I, my recommendation would be agree to what you can agree. Then when we have these one-offs like hyperlinks or emojis, uh, then you come to the court and say, hey, this has been produced in this fashion, uh, but uh, it's giving an incomplete uh, uh, uh uh, picture of, of of what took place, tone and context has been uh, has been stripped, and so we we need to have a reproduction of these particular emails or these particular text messages with emojis attached. If we start going off uh, on that kind of a basis, I think most judges would understand. Yeah, tone and context matters, and we would order a reproduction. Thanks, Judge. So okay. Go ahead, Judge Wackerman. Yeah, I, I think um, when, when we're talking about the ESI protocol, I think Judge Rodriguez makes a very good point, which is um, I, 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 in the way I would put it is one size does not fit all. Uh, when we're talking about an ESI protocol, we are talking about production uh, of discovery. And, and wh wh where do we go back to discovery? We go back to 26B1 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, which says relevant and proportional discovery. So as Judge Rodriguez said, in some cases, the uh, emojis may have no relevance at all. Um, maybe a securities case or, 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 or maybe, um, you know, uh, some other intellectual type property case. Um, and in that case, the parties may just stipulate that, uh, you know, in, in this case, the emojis are, are, are not going to be relevant or not important. We don't see that as an issue. We don't have to spend and waste our time on it. In another case, a threat case, a domestic violence case, uh, a sexual assault case, or a lot of other types of cases that you could come up with, they may be very, very relevant. And in those circumstances, I think the lawyers should try to get together to figure out a way that they're going to save and preserve um, the uh, the emojis and perhaps come to a stipulation pre-trial as to, as to a, a meaning of them, if that's even possible. I don't know. You know, in a civil case, you're 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 helped by depositions where uh, one side can take the other side's depo and ask the sender what did you mean by this? You don't always you don't have that in in federal criminal cases, um, but I do think that we need to when we're thinking about the ESI protocol because I've seen some good uses of ES, ESI protocols and I've seen some that just cause more problems than they're worth, and cost too much money to negotiate for the clients and trouble for the courts. So I think that doing an ESI protocol, if you did every one the same way in every case, I think you'd be making a mistake. I think you need to size and shape your ESI protocol to the type of case it is. Is it a slip and fall at Target? Or is it a, 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 a large uh, copyright case between two computer giants? I think it's going to make a difference what type of case you're dealing with. I completely agree with you. Um, I was going to make one follow-up comment to something that Judge Rodriguez mentioned about, uh, for, for example, having IP cases that wouldn't have emojis involved. I think that when we were only talking about email um, and structured documents, then that would be the case. But now that everyone's using their mobile devices and WhatsApp and Slack and all kinds of chat functions where emojis are very common, we're starting to see more of that kind of evidence even in intellectual property cases. So it's becoming much more consistent. Um, I wanna jump ahead because we've got two or three more issues to cover here and a limited amount of time. Um, Judge Rodriguez, this is next one, proportionality is near and dear to your heart. Um, and we, we talk about it on a regular basis of, um, you know, what are the proportionality considerations? And when it comes to dealing with emojis or unique sources of ESI, what are the things that as a judge you care about from a proportionality perspective? So, you know, uh, I, regrettably, we all jump to a mountain controversy and go straight there first uh, and, and, uh, and sort of asking, well, how much is this case worth and how much are we spending? Uh, but not all cases can fit that mold. You know, race harassment cases, sex harassment cases, you know, have other issues that are uh, of public importance that we got to take into account. So what I generally do is I start going to marginal relevance. I start asking questions to parties about, okay, what have you already gotten? Uh, and then why do you need this? Uh, 
this sounds really elementary, uh, but in my initial scheduling conference with the attorneys, uh, one, I tell them what issues I'm interested in uh, based upon what limited information is before me at the moment. Uh, and so I give them advance warning about what questions I might ask them uh, at the 26F conference. Uh, but then I also ask them to outline in writing before the 26F conference all the causes of action and the elements of those causes of action. And it's, you know, one, it's kind of scary. Some lawyers are like, well, elements. And uh, and sometimes I'm not even sure they know what a cause of action is. But uh, the uh, when they do it, the reason I'm doing it is whenever they start saying, well, I need this and I need that, I tell them, okay, what element of your cause of action is this necessary to establish? Uh, and generally, when we start getting into remote world, all of a sudden that sort of shuts things down. So I'm a big proponent of, of marginal relevance. What do you already have? What do you need? And how much is it going to cost us to get there? Uh, and then tie it back to what you have to establish at time of trial. Right. I, I, yeah, I would, I'm going to add to that. Somebody asked a question and uh, it gets to a lot more of the sexual harassment issues. And we discussed a little bit of this on our prep call. There are certain emojis uh, that have been used that have sexual references to them. Um, and even when, you know, a woman walks into the office and maybe is dressed up for a particular meeting, um, you know, there'll be a lot of fire emojis that fly around on whatever particular apps there are, you know, and at what point does that get interpreted and how, how does that play out in a litigation and what kind of emphasis do you give to that um, as a judge or as a jury um, if you're someone who regularly fires off those, those emojis not thinking twice about it, is it the interpretation of the the, let's call it victim, um, in, in that instance that matters more than uh, what it was that was sent. These are all issues that I think um, are coming up and they impact proportionality, collection, all of these issues that we're talking about. Judge Matthewman, what are your thoughts on proportionality here? Well, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Judge Rodriguez. I think we, we need to uh, size and shape uh, the discovery to the requisites of the case. And I really am a believer in sort of stage discovery, either in, or what I call inside out discovery. So it may be that, you know, let's get this discovery first and come back. Doesn't that give you enough? Do we really have to go further than that? Because a lot of times it's just overkill all the extra discovery that is requested. You know, I just want the discovery so that both sides have a fair shot both sides can prove whatever they have to prove in their case, but I don't want to get into all the wasteful, unnecessary stuff that costs the clients a lot of money and waste a lot of the lawyer's time and, and, and my time. So I do think that this emoji issue, like all discovery, has to be looked at in terms of, of proportionality and how important it is to your case. Right. And if we're getting into a discussion about whether it's really important or not, I, I also agree with Judge Matthewman. I, I call it tiering. And it's like, OK, we're going to do low hanging fruit first and, and see what we got. And uh, and then we'll come back to this issue. But what I want the audience to make sure we uh, we appreciate is the, the other side still has a duty to preserve that evidence. Uh, we're just talking about whether or not we're going to go through the cost of producing the evidence. Mm -hmm. Agreed. 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 Um, I'm going to turn now to um, another issue that comes up with a, a particular case. And this is the uh, case, this Rossback case that we're going to talk about is um, the one that was sent to you on a link uh, that Kat provided in the chat early on. We covered this one on our Case of the Week series way back when in episode 37, so more than a year ago. Um, in the Rossback case, um, this was a retaliation um, case in which um, Expert testimony was provided uh, regarding a text message uh, that was produced by the plaintiff. Um, the text message contained a number of, of issues, but also emojis. And an expert review of the text message showed that the message itself was fabricated. Um, and there are sites now, um, ifaketextmessage.com is one of them, that will allow you to create your own text messages um, and send them as a PDF. 
you'll see um, if you read this decision in its entirety that there are a number of challenges with that because you've got to recreate that message exactly as it would appear from a legitimate text messaging platform. Um, but in the, this particular case, one of the keys was that the emojis that were included in the text messages presented as evidence um, didn't actually exist as of the date of the operating system that was allegedly used to create the text message. So the plaintiff here used, uh, said that she used an iPhone 5 to create that to receive the text message from her uh, supervisor, which she claimed was harassing. Um, but the emojis in the text message themselves did not exist at the time that she alleged she would have received the message. And so um, as we talk about cases you know that we've already discussed today in employment matters, harassment matters, um, we, we have to deal with these issues of when do I have to have an expert? And so, you know, for the judges, you know, this case which raises that expert testimony and forensic examination of mobile devices, um, what is it that you want to see both on motion papers and at a hearing um, from the parties when a case presents technical issues like in Rossbeck? Well, um, I, I'm hoping there won't be an emoji expert. Uh, but certainly a, a, an expert dealing with uh, potentially fraudulent issues with uh, with evidence. And, I, and this is not something new. I mean, there's always been the problem of fraudulent evidence going back before, um, going back many, many, many years. I think a lawyer has a duty to make sure that the lawyer is meeting with the client, understanding the case, and getting from the client whether or not that's a real communication or not whether that's what they did. And if it's not, they need to go out and get an expert and bring that expert in. I mean, this has come up. I, I remember when I was practicing law, I had a case where I represented a police officer who was charged with shooting and killing an individual in the line of duty and then planting a gun on the scene, saying that the man had a gun. And the original photos that were produced showed the first, the first photo with, uh, of, the, of the area with no gun on the ground the second photo with a gun on the ground. So of course the prosecution's argument was that the gun had to be planted because the um, the first picture showed no gun and the second picture taken subsequently showed a gun. I met with the client, I believed the client, I got an expert and just to make a long story short, what ended up happening, it wasn't intentional, it was negligent, but what, what ended up happening was the crime scene technician at the time was not using a digital camera, was using a camera that had film. And they cut the uh, the sequence, they cut the, uh, the negatives to fit them into an envelope. And it turns out they got the uh, sequence wrong. And my expert was able to determine that. And, and when I cross-examined the crime scene expert, I was able to get the crime scene expert to admit that he may have made a problem, may have made a mistake. And what really was the situation was, the very first photo showed the gun and the following photo showed no gun because they removed it from the scene. So my point is, is that fabricated evidence or negligently produced evidence has always been a problem. And it's up to the lawyer to know that and to get the proper expert to make sure that that expert can help the lawyer uh, establish that the evidence was false or the evidence was, was, was negligently produced. Turn yeah, we're going to run into this problem a lot with not only doctored photos, because uh, photoshopping is getting really good now, uh, but audio and video feeds, uh, deep fakes, uh, and now we have emojis here. Uh, I guess the, the couple of learning points is, yeah, lawyers have an obligation uh, to, to, to know the data, in, in this case, uh, a text message with emojis, uh, and, and be savvy enough to 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 understand if there's any kind of, uh, of possible alterations you you if, if you have a case where it's serious enough and we're talking about this is going to be the smoking gun this is the piece of proof for sexual harassment uh you know you, you need to carefully look at that uh text and, and see is there something off about it it is is the font looking odd or is there something going on in this case the uh the rossback case uh supposedly the the original phone uh was uh, was uh, broken 
and uh, and sure enough, the text message didn't indicate any kind of broken uh, 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 glass kind of features, and there were other problems on there. We're all going to have to get a little more savvy. Uh, I think the other point uh, point two is uh, we don't wait till time of trial or until summary judgment motion uh, to start raising these issues with your court. Uh, so you're going to need to bring these to the attention of, of, of the judge uh, uh, sooner rather than much later uh, and, and find out whether or not you're going to have to get court intervention about oh, further discovery on this. Uh, third point is what I'm afraid that we're going to make litigation yet more expensive with all these kind of issues. Uh, and so we're going to need to start looking at uh, where does it really count? Uh, uh, is the, the one piece of evidence that we're challenging really, really crucial, necessary? Or are we going to a sideshow uh, about inappropriate behavior by somebody on on evidence that really is not going to be necessary to the case? Uh, but um, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm seeing uh, more looming expenses on the horizon. Right, yeah, you know, and Rossback Rossback was a case where it was purposely done, according to the opinion. Other cases can be just haphazard or, or negligently or negligently done. The case I was talking about, uh, it was not purposely done. The crime scene tech wasn't out to hurt anybody. It just turned out that way. And luckily we were able to determine it. The client was acquitted, went back to work and you know, eventually retired there successfully after many, many years. And my point is, is that the lawyer has a duty to make sure they know the evidence and to get the expert involved. And that's really what I think is, is most important because uh, there can be a real travesty that can occur in either a civil case or a criminal case if the lawyer doesn't pay enough, enough attention to some of these issues. Well, and I think you perfectly segued us into what's our really our final piece, which is just pulling together all of the different issues that we've talked about and, and really coalescing them into what the obligations of counsel are. And, and you both summed them up very effectively um, there. And I think that one of the things we talked about in prep was that the, these this emojis is just another reason why lawyers have to be sitting down and thinking about the electronic information they have early on in their events um, and, and thinking about how they're going to deal with it, what needs to be handled, whether they need experts, how much it's going to cost, how they can do things cost effectively. But that has to be done up front. Um, and it seems to me from the, the comments that you've both made that we can avoid a lot of cost, a lot of expense, a lot of time um, at the expense of the court uh, in dealing with these issues if we're thinking about them up front. Um, Judge Rodriguez, what additional, what would you add to this list or, or what would you call out from this list that you most want to see from parties before you? Don't use emojis. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. There you but have you know, there, there we're stuck. You know, so language is changing and uh, the English language changes. And so uh, we're now moving to a different form of, of, of language. Uh, so it's here here to stay, unfortunately, I think. Uh, you know, all things change and 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 how we communicate is now changing as well. Excellent. Thanks. Judge Matthewman. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. I think lawyers need to know how to handle collection. They need to get a good expert involved and they need to know what the issues are because sometimes lawyers get overwhelmed. Uh, it's really you got to look at the few issues that are important in your case. Uh, my suggestion has always been to young lawyers, get a copy of the jury instructions early on. Whatever you're trying to prove or disprove, get a copy of the jury instructions. The only evidence you need is the evidence that goes to those elements in the jury instructions. That's it. Uh, you don't need much else. And um, But they need to know what it is they're looking for. And they need to understand that not everything that gets produced might necessarily be accurate. And if it's not, how do you counteract that? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I was going to follow up on that as well as what Judge Rodriguez said about the elements and the causes of action earlier. Um, when when I teach, that's where we start, right? Where What do your jury instructions say? What is it you actually have to prove? And I go a step further as to who do you think has that evidence? Who has those electronic communications that you need to be able to prove those elements? And instead of that big wide net that costs hundreds of thousands or millions or even just tens of thousands of, of dollars, how can you just get the pieces you need to get and then decide where to go forward? 
Um, I love that discussion of proportionality in the scope of discovery as opposed to just proportionality as it's defined by Rule 26. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, these are some of the takeaways that we put together um, for the audience following up on our discussion. Judges, I just want to ask you for your final thoughts um, on emojis, and I'll start with you, Judge Mathman. My final thoughts are that these emojis are here to stay, uh, and so we need to know how to, uh, to deal with them. They're not going away. There will likely be more. There will likely be some new form of communication enhancement that comes every year that we uh, that we live on this earth. So I think we just need to deal with them. We need to understand them and we need to figure out a way to make sure that they are preserved and collected and produced when they're relevant and proportional um, in a case. Because if, if you don't do that, you could run into a spoliation problem, which can create severe uh, problems for your client. Great. Thank you, Judge. Judge Rodriguez? Yeah, I agree with everything that was just said. Uh, you know, I, I, I just the thought just sort of hit me right now. But emojis now is, is a language communication it is almost turning into as we get new emojis developed out there. It's just like the English language. We got colloquialisms in the South and North, and we're we're sort of heading in that same direction with emojis, the newness of emojis, and then the generational use of emojis and how it's changing. Uh, it's uh, it, it's really kind of interesting sometimes how someone's testifying or someone's written something uh, and how everybody interprets it differently. Uh, and so it's no, no less uh, the case with emojis. I completely agree. I completely agree. We've even got new skin tone now for various emojis and your ability to create your own memoji where you can make yourself in likeness of an emoji and add a whole bunch of different uh, contexts and facial expressions to that. That'll, that'll complicate things a little bit more. Um, we've reached the top of the hour. Uh, I want to express my most sincere appreciation to uh, Judges Matthewman and Rodriguez for joining me today, for the time and effort that it took to prepare for um, and be a part of this. Thank you so much. Uh, for offering your insights to the audience. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, again, be sure to register uh, for part four, uh, which will be next week. And um, at this point, uh, Kat, I'm not sure if you wanted me to turn it over to you or just to thank everyone for being here today. And uh, again, thanks judges, appreciate it. I, I also um, want to just say quickly, thank you to everyone. Kelly, you as well uh, for moderating this and taking this on. Um, <clears throat> also, I wanted to remind everyone that we are offering CLE in all 50 states for this, for this session. So if you have joined us and you have not signed up for a, a CLE, um, let me know, get in touch with me, and I will make sure that we um, put you on the list. Uh, I also wanted to thank the Detroit and Chicago chapters, which are having big watch parties today. So that's kind of a fun way of getting everyone together to participate. And uh, so I just thought I'd call that out really quick. And then finally, I want to thank again our sponsors, eDiscovery Assistant and Kelly Twigger for moderating as well as Reveal for um, sponsoring the CLE. Great. And Finally, don't forget to, to join us next week for the final present, you know, the final session where we put it all together. It should be really exciting. So thanks so much. Thank you all so much. Have a great Thank day. You. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Take Thank care. you. Bye.